You're watching Salina Media Connection. Modi Reber, Executive Director of Kansas Interfaith Action, and Marcus Wynn, Community Organizer for Metro Organization for Racial and Economic Equity, gave a presentation on the importance of faith-based advocacy at the state and local levels. The presentation, which took place November 18, 2019, was part of the Intersections of Faith and Health Conference. The conference was hosted by the United Methodist Health Ministry Fund. The following program lasts about 50 minutes. Good afternoon. I am Rabbi Moti Reber. Um, uh, I'm the Executive Director of Kansas Interfaith Action, which I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes telling you what that is. My name is Marcus Wynn. I am a community organizer for Metro Organization for Racial Action. He's going to spend the next 20 minutes after that telling you what that is. So our format here is that we're each going to do an individual presentation about our organizations and the work that we do. Um, and then we'll open for questions and comments and conversation. So hopefully uh, we'll have plenty of time for that. So I'm, uh, this is actually a long presentation. It's about more than 20 minutes, so I'm going to skip through some of it. Um, I'm just going to give you the gist of it, of parts of it. Um, so I, I give this presentation in churches and congregations uh, all over the state. Um, so we're, what we do is faith-based advocacy on the state level, uh, focused on Topeka. So we start by saying that um, uh, people of faith have had an outsized influence on um, movements for social justice since the beginning of the country. And for the sake of time, I'll just say that's William Lloyd Garrison, who was a, a, uh, a congregationalist, I believe. He was the most famous uh, um, abolitionist um, in the pre Civil War period and was actually probably the most hated man in the country at one point. Daniel Berrigan, anti war activist, Catholic priest, Doris uh, the Day, um, Catholic worker, um, Martin Luther King, and other guys. So I'm going to whip through this. The Bible tells us that God is concerned for the poor. I'm going to stipulate that. Pastor, would you, would, would you, would you agree with that uh, interpretation of the Bible? Yeah. Okay. So there are dozens and dozens of, of texts in, the, in, in Scripture that tell us that God is concerned for the poor, care for the, wit care for the widow, care for the orphan, care for the stranger. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through these. I could do a whole half an hour just on this. Um, whatever you didn't do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Um, okay? Give justice to the weak and fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. So, how do we do that is the question that we're asking today. So Kansas Interfaith Action is a statewide, multi faith, issue advocacy organization that works on a variety of social, economic, and climate justice issues. So, that's the mission statement. Um, we filled a gap in Kansas politics because at the time when we were founded in 2016, um, when you think about faith and public policy in Kansas, it all came from the super conservative side of things. Um, the, not talking about the Bible verses that we were talking about, but talking about two verses from Leviticus primarily. Um, instead of 30 verses from, you know, from the prophetic tradition. Um, so there wasn't anybody working on this, in this space on the state level in Kansas when we started. Other states have Council of Churches chapters, which is ecumenical. Some, some denominations have policy offices in different state capitals. Kansas didn't have anything like that. So there's tens of thousands of people just like you who belong to congregations throughout the state of Kansas who are not being represented from their faith tradition in public policy. So that's, what, that's the niche that we start, that we try to put. And our slogan is putting faith into action. So we work under, uh, our, our framing is Dr. King had what he called the three evils, uh, which were racism, poverty, and militarism. So we have four evils, because of, I guess, because of inflation since the 60s. Um, racism, poverty, gun violence, primarily gun violence, and climate disruption, which is something that was not known in the 60s, but is very prominent now. And each of these has policy implications or, uh, or all the things that we work on are based on one of these categories. So some of the illnesses that come from these, from these bigger diseases, militarized policing, mass incarceration, 
um, voter suppression, racialized immigration enforcement, Islamophobia is a huge issue. Um, racism is something that white people like to ignore, but it can't be ignored. It can't, you, can't, you can't do social justice without racial justice. It just can't be ignored. Especially given the way that the country is framed. Poverty, economic justice, which is the right to the things that we need to succeed and thrive, meaning food, water, health care, um, clean air, stable climate, um, the, uh, the absence of fear of going to school. Well, that's not, that would be in this category, but um, progressive taxation, the right to a living wage, um, the right to organize, uh, to have some control of your work environment. Uh, violence, both overseas and at home. Um, we spend uh, $750 billion a year on the military, which is money that can be used for um, health care or education. Um, we have this uh, endless war, and then also, of course, our country is awash with guns, unregulated guns. Um, and we see every day there's a new, there's a new uh, crisis around. Um, Kansas has one of the worst, uh, is one of the worst states in terms of gun sense legislation. Um, it's been radically loosened from even from 10 years ago. Uh, the laws in Kansas on that are very, very different. Um, and then climate disruption. Uh, the need both to address the, uh, the, the cause of climate, which is carbon emissions, but also to build resilience into our system, resilience towards the climate changes that are already in the pipeline. So that again means uh, the health repercussions of climate change uh, in terms of 100 degree days, access to fresh water, uh, increased health and asthma, heart disease, uh, access to clean water, uh, floods and droughts, all kinds of repercussions of, of climate. Uh, climate, dis climate disruption is a justice issue because the people who are hurt first and worst are the people who are always hurt first and worst by, by injustice, which is poor people and people of color, both in the country and overseas. Right? So I always like to say this in, to Christian, Christian audiences, you know, the, uh, the people that you've been helping all these years with mission work you know, health care, food and health care and nothing but nets, those are the people who are hurt the worst by this. You know, we cause the problem, they suffer the consequences, that is not just. But these are all interrelated because you can't really pick these apart. Um, if you look at, if you look at, uh, you know, why has Medicaid not been expanded yet in Kansas, a lot of the language around it is racialized. Right, so because we, we're afraid that people who are undeserving will get access to that's completely racialized language. So we're building from a moral agenda. So Reverend Barber is one of our kind of leading lights nationally uh, from the Poor People's Campaign. If you've never heard of him, you should look him up because he's awesome. Um, Anti-racist, anti-poverty, pro-justice, pro-labor, transformative, and deeply rooted and built within a fusion coalition. All right, so I'm kind of skipping through here. How do we make ourselves, how do we make our voices heard? We do that through advocacy. Advocacy is both talking to legislators and also building a constituency on the ground for support of these various issues that we work on. Uh, we work in and through communities of faith to represent the faith community in decisions that are made in Topeka. Um, advocacy means testifying as I am a registered lobbyist. Um, I like to say my client is God. He <laughs> doesn't pay well, but the benefits are great. <laughs> Um, testimony on bills, um, uh, 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 building connections with legislators, bringing people into the Capitol, sort of regular people, um, not lobbyists, student citizen action lobby days, and then and then um, and, and then doing presentations and outreach around the state. So speaking in churches, I do sermons, I do this kind of presentation. Um, we have public policy forums like we're having one tonight in Wichita. I'm going to go back here. These are our current legislative priorities. We're usually, we usually work in coalitions, um, so we don't run all of these coalitions, but for instance, the Alliance for Healthy Kansas is the main uh, Medicaid, co Medicaid expansion coalition um, framework. We are the faith voice of that coalition. So if they need somebody in a collar to show up to do testimony, or we want to do a statement from a faith perspective, that, that's, where they, that's where we're involved. So we have, a, we have an important niche 
kind of framing, we're, we're, we're always the faith, we're not, we're not the biggest partners of these coalitions, but we're an integral part of these coalitions. And also, we're the ones we're talking about, at least from a moral point of view. A lot of people talk about dollars and cents, and I think that's really important. Medicaid expansion is a dollars and cents issue, but it's also a moral issue, and who's going to talk about that aspect of it, if not us? Um, we do a public policy forums around the state. Has anyone ever been to one? Sure, been to one. Okay. Right? And uh, uh, so these are, these are uh, panel discussions with issue advocates and experts. Uh, so somebody from the ACLU will come and talk about voter rights. And so a lot of churches do, um, they do uh, candidate forums. These are issue forums, so people can know about the issues that are coming. And we do these every year. We do at least three to five a year. Uh, during the election campaign, we'll do them around the state, different places. This year, we had one in Topeka, one in Mission, and one in Wichita. Now, why is this important to do? Um, why is it important to do this work in faith communities? This is kind of uh, a question. Um, this is a question that your church that your church may ask. So. Uh, there's, there's a couple of reasons. One is at the beginning of the, of the, of the presentation, I talked about the, the, that our texts tell us, that our teachings and our scripture tells us that care for the less fortunate is important. That it's important to God. Right? So we believe what these teachings tell us. So that's the first reason is because our scripture tells us that this is important. Um, the second thing is that uh, churches faith leaders have a certain kind of moral positioning in their communities, a moral authority. So if, if a congregation or a denomination comes out with a statement on, for instance, Medicaid expansion, that can be influential to some people. Some people it won't be, but some people it will be influential. Right? If the social justice committee of the church says something, that means something to somebody. Um, congregations build, are in the business of building connections between people, that's actually what they do. Um, care and concern for each other, which is something that we need a lot of in this day and age, um, as all the connections between us have been picked apart um, in, this t in this time of super hyper individualism. What we're trying to do is move that conversation beyond the walls of the individual church and into a multi faith alliance. Um, so if the Methodist and the Presbyterian and the Jewish congregation and the Lutheran congregation get in a room together, all of a sudden you have to keep the chapter. Keep it. Okay, I think that's where we're at. Um, and that's building the beloved community, modeling how important it is for us to work across these kind of boundaries. Um, and also, I happen to think that there's a lot of bad religion in the world right now, um, and that uh, actually, sort of uh, speaking from a place of the values that we share of um, tolerance and justice and love and compassion is a is a is a antidote to some of the sort of the intolerant religion that we see in the public square. Right. I we actually um, have strategic partnerships with a number of different organizations. We are an official, uh, actually, a public policy office of the of the ELCA of the Lutheran Church. Um, we, have, uh, we have an official partnership with the Lutheran Church and with the, with the Congregationalists, the UCC, and um, somewhat less formal relationship with the um, Unitarians. Um, and we also have partnerships with some organizations that, have, that share uh, advocacy priorities but don't necessarily have the capacity to do actual advocacy like the state chapter of the NAAC. Um, I actually am a Lutheran public policy official. <laughs> this is an actual true sake. <laughs> Please. It amuses me no one. Um, we're one of I think it's I think there's like 30 state policy offices, and we're one of them. And then uh, Reverend Barbara, so we're not talking oh, the other thing I wanted to say is about advocacy, and I should put a slide in here about this. So some people question whether advocacy is something that a church should do. Right? And we obviously we think that you should. Um, we think that advocacy is the third leg of faith development. I was sort of thinking of the stool, the third leg of faith development. So the first is personal spiritual development, so what Christians call salvation. The second is mission work, 
which is very well developed in most Christian churches, which is helping to address wounds or problems, um, in the you know sort of helping to address the, the, the damage that's been done. Advocacy looks at what caused the damage and tries to address that. So where mission work is cleaning up the river, advocacy is looking up the river to see why it's polluted in the first place and trying to get it root causes. So it's not political in the sense of partisan, because we don't, you know, I don't care which party you are as long as you're supportive of Medicaid expansion. Literally, I don't care. Um, what we want is these policies that help people to be uh, influenced. Um, and, and the way the Reverend Barber says it is it's not right or left, it's right or wrong. And it's not right or left, but it's the moral center. So we try to find this moral positioning um, and, and talk about it from there. You know, I, I also, I'm not necessarily uh, bought into specific policy um, prescriptions. We can say that we want, to, we want fair taxation. What that means is part of the process of, of, of governance, but we want there to be fair taxation. And what, what could that mean? Um, and then so he says, we're trying to move our politics to a higher ground from ending, from all these, as we said at the beginning, from the ending of slavery to suffrage, the New Deal, the civil rights movement. Um, moral underpinning when people moved away from their political parties and said, there's something higher based on our deepest principles and our deepest values. So uh, this is how to get in touch with us. We have a Facebook page if you're on Facebook. Um, I also have palm cards, which I will uh, leave out. Um, very interested in having conversations, further conversations with folks, um, visiting your communities, and trying to engage people in the work that we're doing. And I talk very quickly, so um, being a uh, fast-talking Jew from New Jersey, I do tend to talk fast, so I hope everybody got most of what I have to say.
So Moore Square is made up of locally around three dozen congregational and organizational members within the Kansas City metro region. Um, like I said, historically that's been rooted in communities of faith and I believe will continue to be. Um, like local congregations though, we see the shifts in demographics of how uh, communities of faith function and who is attending communities of faith. And so we're trying to evolve as local congregations try to evolve. Um, we have a robust and growing individual membership program within Moore Squared, so um, maybe someone who shares all the values but isn't active in a, a local congregation can still get involved and engage in the work. Um, like I said, 15 years. Um, historically, that's been more active on the Missouri side of the border, uh, although we have been in Kansas for most of that time. Um, Whereas uh, a lot of groups like KIFA have been focused on state level legislation, uh, and for good reason, uh, we have, I, I, I hesitate to say that Modi is not involved in the grassroots because he definitely is. Uh, but if he's in the grassroots, I think more squared is probably in the dirt. Uh, <laughs> we are uh, a little bit more um, focused on hyper-local um, organizing. Um, so I will go into a congregation um, I probably don't do it as often, but I, I do preach once in a while. Um, we do a lot of speaking with local congregations and trying to build teams within local congregations to organize around what is, what is the issue that you all as a community are facing and feel called to um, in this work. So, um, yeah, I'm going to rearrange some of this because I don't want to repeat what Louis already said and said better than I could probably. Um, but I do want to talk about two things. Um, why faith-based and what's distinctive about community organizing? Because I think community organizing is uh, not com competing with the advocacy model, but a little bit different and complementary. Um, and that's what I mean when I say um, getting in the dirt of the grassroots. Uh, so faith-based, as I mentioned earlier, and Modi mentioned also, it's, it's not a part of it. I had a priest in Chicago. I, I attended an Episcopal church in Chicago for a long time. And he told me one morning, um, the gospel is always political, but never partisan. And that has always stuck with me. And I think it's true, Not obviously that's spoken from a Christian context. It's true of the, the prophetic tradition within Judaism, um, and as well as non-Abrahamic religions. Um, there is a common call to be engaged in decisions uh, that affect our daily lives. How do we make those decisions together? That's something that all of the major religious traditions uh, talk about and, and argue that we should bring a moral lens to that, uh, to that conversation. Uh, I had a, a, a really interesting experience this summer uh, in contrast to my more partisan work in Chicago, I have a, a really engaged leader in Johnson County who's a, uh, a registered Republican uh, and has run for office as a Republican. Um, I like to tell people, I, in my partisan life, I organized for Bernie Sanders, but I grew up in a, in a household where my father listened to Rush Limbaugh every day. Um, and we got along by talking about those issues rather than just avoiding them. Um, but when I was in Chicago, I was pretty partisan, and I, I worked with pretty partisan people. Um, and then I came to Kansas, and I've got this minister in Johnson County who's fairly conservative. Um, but because we, we frame these issues in a way that is not about um, partisanship, but about uh, the moral lens that we bring to the issue, um, we were asked to help mobilize communities of faith in pressuring Congresswoman Davis to uh, sign on in support of raising the minimum wage. So I got these postcards uh, and asking ministers to circulate them in <clears throat> congregations saying, you know, it's a moral issue that people can't afford to pay their bills when they're working full time. And this minister said, well, give me 50. Uh, and he called me Monday morning and said, I've got 50 postcards for you. And I thought, you know, if I had been working on this issue as part of a, a 
party or even just uh, a more partisan organization, there's no way that we would have been able to get that community or, uh, or that congregation to get involved in this. But I think there's a real power that we overlook and we take for granted that we don't appreciate sometimes in talking about these issues in moral terms. Um, and in a place like Kansas, where, uh, where the politics are fairly pragmatic, I think, at least historically, um, I think that's what we need to get some things done. We have to build bigger coalitions. We have to build welcoming coalitions, no matter which party you're a part of, or any party. Um, I think also one of the things that um, doing this work from a faith-based perspective brings is an expanded understanding of, uh, that our values bring to phrases like health equity. Um, this is a conference about the intersection of faith and health. Um, and we know uh, that there are many social determinants that affect the health outcomes of local communities, right? I got hired uh, two years ago on a grant from the Kansas Health Foundation uh, with a broad, vague mandate to promote health equity. In, in KCK and the surrounding areas. Uh, so my assumption when I when I came into this job was Medicaid expansion is the pressing issue in Kansas. I guess that's what I'll be talking about. Um, and we do talk about that. We, we haven't overlooked it completely. But I got to, to work and started knocking on doors and uh, talking with ministers, especially in the northeast region of Wyandotte County, which is predominantly African American. And what I heard over and over again was, well, we don't really care that much about Medicaid expansion right now. It's not at the top of our list. Um, and so I kept asking, what, what is it in your community that you want to hear about? And they said, well, there is a historic, deep pattern of racism and violence against the community perpetrated by the police department. Which is a little bit scarier to work on than Medicaid expansion, uh, but <laughs> we kept hearing it. We heard it from people who didn't know one another. Uh, I heard the same phrases from people who didn't know one another. There was this deeply ingrained skepticism and fear within the community. And so, at some point as an organization, uh, and as an organizer myself, I had to say, I don't know better. I'm, I'm white, I'm well educated, I'm not from Kansas City. Uh, I have to take seriously the wisdom that's on the ground, um, the concerns that are on the ground. And so we also brought to it this sense of a healthy community is one where people don't live in fear. So I, I think you know there has been a little bit of uh, hesitance sometimes to say, well, you're working on health equity, but you're talking about uh, police accountability. Uh, and I have to say, yes, I think I think a healthy community is one where that relationship between community and police department is a healthy one. And where that doesn't exist, we should be actively pursuing policies that will um, bring accountability and also trust. <coughs> and that's good for everyone. We're also working on issues of housing. Um, we are in the early stages on the Kansas side, but on the Missouri side we have a long history of working for affordable and qualitative housing. Uh, Morris Squared was uh, proud to be at the steering committee level for the Healthy Homes Initiative in Kansas City, Missouri, which was passed by a ballot initiative a year ago, was it? I think it was a year ago. Um, and I want to get into the, the model of community organizing a little bit and what it en enables, but I'll just say I think the, the radically grassroots approach to community organizing, while it's labor intensive sometimes, uh, gives us the opportunity to win big issues. And on the Healthy Homes Initiative, um, which provided uh, a process for tenants to request an inspection by the health department when landlords didn't respond to basic habitability concerns, um, the landlords got very organized and they upspent us 25 to 1 uh, 
on that campaign. Uh, but we ended up winning uh, with still more than 55% of the ballot initiative vote. Um, and I think that's due to uh, the relationship building that is inherent in community organizing. How am I doing? I think two more quick points. Um, <clears throat> Faith-based organizing is about more than charity. Um, Modi referenced the, the image of a river and going up river, uh, addressing the causes. Um, we like to talk a lot within More Squared and the Gamaliel Network about where is the power? Uh, Spencer and I were talking a little bit about this before everyone came in. Um, but we follow a model, a goal of not just um, helping people, and helping people is good, but, um, but empowering people on the ground. Uh, while I'm speaking with ministers, I often use the, the analogy of a, a food pantry. It seems like every one of my congregations has a food pantry within it, which is great. Um, and what I tell them is, you know, that is, that is a model of ministry that's based on charity. And I don't want you to stop doing it. I think we need it. Um, we need you to be helping the hungry have food. But I think we also, as people of faith, are called to ask questions like, why can't people afford food in the first place? That's where we move from a conversation about charity into a conversation about justice. Um, So community organizing, um, I'm just going to look through this quickly so we can get to questions. Um, I think one of the distinctive things about community organizing is the theory of change. Uh, how do we achieve the changes? Um, it's not just that I have a laundry list of policy priorities, which I do, and I'm happy to talk about. But I think it's also important that we ask the question, how do we achieve that change? because there are different ways to get to those goals. Um, I like to, I don't know, I, just, I think most people miss this, but in 2008 there was this, in the Democratic primary, there was this little back and forth that was mostly overlooked, but lodged in my memory of, between uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. I don't know if you noticed this, I don't think we've ever talked about it, but there was a conversation about the, around the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, and Hillary Clinton made the, the case that it took a president to get that done in LBJ and advocating and really leveraging those relationships on Capitol Hill. And Obama came back and said, you are giving the credit to the wrong people. Uh, it, the Civil Rights Act was passed because of the movement built by people like Dr. King and others on the ground uh, who successfully mobilized thousands and tens of thousands of people uh, to get that legislation passed in a way where LBJ never would have put his neck out if he didn't know that the people on the ground were going to uh, push and seize that power back that they should have had in the first place. Um, I had a conversation this week with, um, I have a, a close friend who is a public health department official uh, and is doing some really great stuff and we, um, we come up with this idea uh, our local DA had done a series of expungement fairs uh, over the summer, which was really great, and above and beyond what he needed to do. Uh, an expungement, if you're unaware, allows for low-level um, felonies to be removed from your permanent record or sealed, uh, but you have to opt in, you have to get a lawyer, you have to pay fees, and there are two states across the, the country that do this automatically. If you qualify, under a certain amount of a certain level of uh, crime, and the time passes and your record's clean, uh, they have an algorithm that just automatically seals that record. So it doesn't pop up on background checks, it makes it easier for you to rent an apartment or apply for a job. And so, um, why did I start telling this story? <laughs> so, um, Wesley and I had this conversation. Um, and he started running with, uh, he, he started having all these conversations with legislators that I was unaware of. And uh, we just had a conversation this week. And um, 
I think it's really important as we, it looks really optimistic and I'm hopeful that we can build a coalition around this proposal. Um, we have legislators on both parties who are willing to get on board. But it's also important that as we pursue this policy goal that it's clear that these, uh, <coughs> This change is not coming because of some benevolent overlords that exist in Topeka, but people on the ground are actually empowering themselves, advocating for themselves, and getting real change, because that's how our democracy is supposed to work. I think I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions. So uh, one of the ways that we're addressing climate change is through the intersections of climate and health. So the health and health. I'm trying to introduce the conversation about climate change in Kansas by talking about its health implications. So there's a statement um, on the web called the, climate, the Kansas Climate and Health Declaration. It's very pertinent for this work for this gathering. So it's at resiliencekansas.org. ResilienceKansas.org. It's a statement that we're trying to get individuals and churches and organizations to sign on to. So go take a look at it. We'd love you to sign on to it. And also, if you want to bring it back to your community, uh, to ask the, the deacons or our Baptists to come themselves. Excuse me. Um, the board of directors, whatever. Uh, to ask them to sign on to it also, we would really encourage that. Climate and Health, Kansas Climate and Health Declaration at resiliencekansas.org. And we're happy to take questions. I have a question and a comment. Uh, the question is, I'd like to, uh, if you have a copy of the subtitles of your four evils, uh -huh. I'd like that. Yeah. My comment is, um, in early October, I was at a conference in New York, and part of the conference was we spent a day at the UN. And in our tour, I have to put down the microphone, there was a chart or a visual that showed, and the circle was immense. The nations of the world spend $5 billion a day, every 24 hours, on war. And there was a ticker that showed it was up to three billion, this is late afternoon, and she said by midnight that goes to five, and it starts over. Five billion dollars a day on war, the nations of the earth. And then the next circle was only about the size of a basketball. And I didn't I don't remember what that was spent on. And then the circles got smaller and smaller. But it just blows your mind when you see that. What could be done with that kind of funds and resources for people and communities? Thank you. Thank you. Here's this. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you know, when we talk about, you see it in the presidential campaign now, when you talk about um, health care or, or access to higher education, everybody says, well, how do you pay for that? How do you pay for that? Because it's a huge, big thing. But when it's time to raise, again, the, the defense budget um, no or to give a tax cut to corporations, the question of how you pay for that never comes up. The, the entire conversation is backwards. You know, let's remember the postcard about holding a big sale for the army. Anybody else? Can I say a word? Yeah. Uh, one of the things I really didn't get into or have time to talk about was that um, the one, of, in addition to the network, uh, the benefit of being part of the national network is that we have access to a series of trainings uh, for local leadership. Um, and one of the trainings we do is on how to cut a good issue, um, which seems very um, mundane in a lot of ways, but is actually very useful. And I think, um, to your point, that these issues seem so large, these problems seem so large, that we're spending so much money on war and so 
little priority towards something like healthcare. Um, one of our rules around a good issue cut, which um, you know are always made to be broken, but um, generally speaking, is it needs to be winnable within six months to a year. And I think that's it's hard to think about something like militarism, um, or even you know one of the problems we're facing right now is immigration. Um, Immigration really needs to be solved at a federal level. It's probably not going to be solved in, in Congress. Um, and so I like to think back to the experience of the civil rights movement <coughs> and remember that they built momentum through a series of steps. It wasn't zero to the Civil Rights Act or zero to the Voting Rights Act. They desegregated one lunch counter at a time, one bus line at a time. Uh, and so it's a challenge, but also a really necessary piece to, to say, like, how can, we, how can we move forward on an issue like this uh, and gain some momentum? Because if we, can, if we can get some smaller victories, we can build some momentum, grab some attention, get some people engaged in a way that's necessary to get some larger victories also. Who else? Lots of, <clears throat> lots of grassroots organizations suffer from lack of funding or resources. Uh, and I'm not supposing that the groups that you work with are very bad or very good at fundraising, but I would like to hear some of your experiences with the support that you get from your member organizations. We talk about power uh, as the ability to act, and that's what we're really trying to build, is build power in local communities. Um, and power in this very narrow sense has two sources, organize people and organize money. Uh, so uh, I think it, a lot of times we overlook it, but it's really necessary. We have a series of dues that's very small, and, and a sliding scale for our member organizations. Um, we also do fundraising. I actually have a fundraising prayer breakfast Thursday morning if anybody would like to attend. It's going to be 7.30 on the campus of Church of the Resurrection in Leewood. Um, but it's, I think it's always a, a challenge to not only raise the money, but raise the money in a sustainable way. It's not uh, overly grant heavy and liable to expire and not be renewed. Um, and, yeah, it's a constant challenge. Uh, so we're not a membership organization as such, um, we're, a, a, we're a grassroots organization. Um, so we started off, our, our model is that 75% of our budget should come from donations and 25 should come from grants. Um, a lot of organizations like ours would be caught heavy on grants, um, which is, like I said, has, a, has drawbacks. Um, we want to show that, we want to show the potential funders that we're a sustainable organization that they fund us or not. Um, it's very, uh, it's very hands and mouth. Um, we have managed to become still doing it. You know, I do, you know, I'm the employee of the organization. Um, we, uh, I went full time for the first time this year. I kind of don't worry too much about, um, I, I, I'm just, as long as my, as long as my check players, I'm okay. That's kind of how I've been doing it. It's, it's really, a, it's really been an active pay. Um, and, you know, we have found that there are people who are willing to donate a little bit more um, to help to help sustain it, uh, and um, you know we're still doing it. And people find the work that we're doing valuable. We just got a grant for the first time this year. Uh, probably that's going to continue to grow. Uh, so uh, people, national funders have not been interested in funding work in Kansas so much uh, because they see it as a lost cause. I mean, all the even when we were doing climate change inclusively, the purple states would get funding, but the red states would not. Even though we were doing work that was much more, in some ways, more difficult. Um, so that's changing a little bit now. Um, but we've also sort of built a name for ourselves. People know who we are. Um, the people, the people who support what I'm doing, want me to be there. Like they want me to have a badge. They want me to be talking to legislators. That's what they're paying for. Uh, 
we're, we are expanding in Kansas, uh, and there's a desire to expand further, especially in the Midwest. Um, so I didn't say this earlier, but I have business cards. I'd love to chat with anybody if anybody has any questions. An, an example from Nebraska that is just developing that in, in Omaha, the three Abrahamic faiths uh, have a campus yeah. where they are building their church synagogue uh, mosque. And it's just really interesting to follow this. That I mean, first to get to that stage where you're willing to share the same property and then build on it, and then the next stage is what kind of, of uh, cooperation and programs are going to be shared by these three? And yeah, it's it's still happening, of course, slowly. I think anybody who's tried to do that sort of interfaith work knows it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, but it's also really powerful when it comes together. It's worth the challenge. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you very much. That was a presentation on faith-based advocacy. You're watching Salina Media Connection.